Hello, my name is Hilary Garcia. I'm a healthcare attorney with Disability Rights Texas, and this is a presentation on Medicaid denials and appeals. Just so you're aware, this session is broken into three sections. I will be the presenter for each session, and I will introduce each session, excuse me, each session separately. So we're on session one, denial notices. So we will discuss what is a denial notice and what your due process rights are. So information that has to be present in the denial notices. And um, we do provide samples on what to look for and what to be on the lookout for within the writing of the denial notices and the information that you will receive when a service has been denied or reduced. And um, we'll be sure to point out things within the notices about information on how to appeal and what a Medicaid fair hearing is. So on this slide, we talk about due process and um, what we do want to make sure is that the main purpose of the denial notice is to make sure that the party that the service is being denied or reduced is aware um, of the rationale or the reason why the service is being reduced or denied or the Medicaid waiver and that you have the right to a hearing or to appeal the process and the right to services being continued or maintained pending the outcome of your appeal. <clears throat> we will provide um, or sources are provided about your due process rights. They can also be included within the denial notice themselves. Um, so we do provide sources um, of where your due process rights originate. And that does include both federal and state um, fraud and fair hearings like policies as well. And we'll discuss that as we discuss the notices. <clears throat> so as part of your, your rights within the notice is before a service is reduced or denied or before your Medicaid waiver is completely stopped, you have to receive notice 10 days before the date of the intended action, which means you should not receive a denial notice and then be told that the next day the service is going to be stopped. <clears throat> you do have the right to a fair hearing. Um, there are certain circumstances where you may not have the right to a hearing, but you have the right to still receive the notice. Um, the exceptions are very limited, but we do want to make sure that you're aware that your right arises if a service is terminated, suspended, or reduced. <clears throat> and then we do want to make sure um, that there is also an opportunity to request a hearing if, and especially in circumstances where we, and we quoted reasonable promptness, um, and we kind of put an asterisk by it because there are situations or circumstances where you're pending a decision and it's been such a long time that you do have the right to appeal the length of time that it's taken for you to receive a notice on the action or um, in circumstances where services, especially when you haven't received, is still pending and it's been such a long time that you can raise the issue of reasonable promptness because this is a specific service that needs to be addressed quickly or due to your health um, and or disability, it's a decision that would affect more or require more prompt attention. So you do have an argument about reasonable promptness. So we do break down the notices because you will receive multiple notifications after you receive an initial denial notice. So the most important notice you receive is, of course, your initial denial notice that tells you 10 days or potentially longer, but it's required that they at least give you 10 day notice. Um, here's your notice that within potentially 10 days, this is the action that the managed care company, the Health and Human Services Commission, or the Texas Medicaid Healthcare Partnership intends to enact. So 
Um, that information can be quite a bit um, because it does have to include information about um, appeal rights, what a Medicaid Fair Hearing is. So it can be a few couple of pages, um, which is why we wanted to have this session on the fair, uh, excuse me, on denial notices so that you're aware of what to anticipate or expect and kind of what to look out for. Because it is a few pages, most often people do look at just the introductory information or the rationale for the denial and may not look at all the other information that is also presented. Um, but of important that we wanna mention within the denial notice is it does start the time clock for your appeal. So when you can request an appeal, when you can request continuation of services and how to request an appeal and or a fair hearing. <clears throat> um, so there are a couple of reasons besides the termination, reduction or suspension of services that you can also receive a denial notice. Um, and we wanted to at least point out that certain circumstances there that can arise within managed care companies or organizations. So your health plan might receive a request for a service and or equipment. Um, they can give you notice if they've requested that information from the agency that requested on your behalf that they don't have all the information to make a decision. And that's where you get a notice that says that you, they've received an incomplete request. So this kind of puts you um, on notice to check with the agency. So for example, if you've requested a wheelchair with specific specifications and your durable medical equipment or DME agency has submitted information on your behalf to request the wheelchair with the specifics that you need. Um, you might receive a notice from your health plan saying we didn't receive this particular document or we didn't receive all the information so we cannot make a determination. So that does put you on notice to, hey, you need to check in with the DME agency and see how this can potentially be resolved before they make a formal decision. Um, for other notices, what um, you have to be on the lookout for, so if it's a denial, reduction, or suspension, is they do have to provide the reason. They have to provide a rationale. Why was the service denied? Why was it reduced? Why does it have to be suspended? Um, there should be a part of why we also wanted to have a presentation on this is sometimes the language is very vague and not specific um, to use specifically. And if it is specific, they just mention the individual's diagnosis versus tying the diagnosis to the actual reason. So you might receive information that this is your diagnosis, this is what you requested, but nothing really tied together how they made the decision. They'll just tell you, this is our decision. Um, and so we wanna kind of make everyone aware that a decent notice is supposed to provide you information that you can tell and you can explain to someone else. I received this now notice from my health plan, or the Health and Human Services Commission or Team HP, and this is why I'm being denied. Now, don't be concerned if that doesn't happen because again, we see notices that we would determine are inadequate because they don't provide you, the beneficiary with the information you need to know, how do I combat this denial, determination or suspension? It should be easily understandable and written to where you can understand, but again, don't be concerned if it's not. It's just, this is information of, that you should be aware of that you have the right to this information. And they do have to cite to either state federal law or the policy that supports their decision. And you also have the right to request that information from your health plan, from the Health and Human Services Commission or the Texas Medicaid Healthcare Partnership. The party that is actually sending you the denial notice, you have the right to ask for um, the policy that supports their decision. And it'll also mention that in your denial notice. <clears throat> so um, MMCOs are Medicaid managed care organizations. Um, some people call them like, this is my insurance, this is my health plan. Um, so people might have different names for the, your managed care company, but they're the agency that handles 
all the requests for services that are made on your behalf. So when a doctor orders a service, if you have nursing, durable medical equipment needs, it goes to an agency and the agency submits to your managed care company or your Medicaid managed care company. And they are the ones that will issue authorizations, denials or approvals. <clears throat> and we know that you might get a lot of documentation, which again is why we see the importance of kind of explaining how the process should work, what to be on the lookout for um, when a, a service is requested and when you receive a formal response in the form of a letter from your managed care company. Um, we will discuss the differences between eternal appeals versus fair hearings because there is a difference. And the timelines to request an appeal for a fair or a fair hearing are also different. Um, but all the notices do have to alert you that um, you have this amount of time to request an appeal. They may not say internal appeal, but because the letter is coming from the managed care company, um, they're the ones that handle initially an appeal. So it goes directly to the managed care company. When you get to a fair hearing, it is a state fair hearing. So therefore it goes to the Health and Human Services Commission Appeals Division, and they will issue a formal fair hearing date and time. Um, so it doesn't necessarily go through the managed care company. They make a decision on the very first appeal. And if you wanna appeal it further, it goes to the Health and Human Services Commission Appeals Division, and it'll be heard by a Medicaid fair hearing officer. And not to worry, it'll be repeated again in sessions because um, I know it's a lot of information to take in, but this information is included further along in your denial notices. Um, with the importance of noting the specific time frame and range that they allow or operate under. <clears throat> so I mentioned briefly sometimes that these denial notices that they're sending beneficiaries can be vague or not specific enough to the individual or the beneficiary. Um, so we want to make sure that there's certain questions that you do kind of question or ask yourself when you're reviewing this information. And oftentimes, especially when we speak to clients, it's not that difficult for them to realize that the notice is inadequate because we ask them, like, what is the reason? And oftentimes we're responded with, I don't really know. This is what it says, but this doesn't make sense. So if you're looking at your notice and that's what you're thinking, then chances are it's probably an inadequate notice. Um, and we wanted to point out some of the common like keywords or phrases that you'll find in denial notices that we find are very vague because not medically necessary, that doesn't necessarily tell you anything um, because when you don't really know what medically necessary means or how it pertains to you exactly or to your disability. And again, it's supposed to be very case specific to the beneficiary, um, which makes these terms that they don't define very difficult for you to know, this is why my service is being suspended, reduced or denied. Um, we also want to point out that because they're kind of are redoing or trying to attempt to provide adequate denial notices, um, that some of the things that we want our clients or individuals to let us know about is if they receive a notice that doesn't tell them or doesn't provide them with the information on the timeline to request appeals or information on requesting a fair hearing. Um, sometimes what we see is normally, like I mentioned, the denial notice itself can be about two pages long. Then they provide you a Spanish copy along with an English copy. And then you are going to give be given pages about appeal rights, about fair hearing. There's there's forms for you to fill out. There's also um, recommendations or opportunities to request to be represented. So they typically provide some um, legal aid information. So your two page now notice is actually like a packet of information that the notice comes with. Um, and so it normally can range depending on the MCO, but how many pages is a total? So it can be 17, 20 something pages of documentation that they're sending you with this initial denial notice. 
So we don't want you just to focus on the first two pages, but also to get to the information on the appeals and the forms that you can fill out to request both an, an appeal and or a fair hearing. And so we didn't want to provide a sample denial notice. Um, this was provided to one of our clients. So of course, we redacted personal information. Um, and it is an initial denial notice. Um, and the reason why, again, we're bringing up initial denial notice versus other denial notices that we will get into is because it is important for you to know that the initial denial notice does kind of start the time frame for your appeal for your secondary information that you will receive. Um, things to kind of consider is normally they'll give you um, when the date the decision is effective, which is important to note. Again, it's supposed to be 10 days after the date of the letter. Um, it shouldn't be that you receive the letter dated, let's say January 4th, and it says that the date of the decision is affected is January 5th because that would be unlawful. They have to give you 10 days before the action actually takes place. Um, and then of course, they do have to have information about what service is being denied. Um, and then, so it'll say service is effective. Um, and then they're supposed to provide you again with their rationale um, and their policy. So you'll see within this sample um, that they mention under the we made this decision because section, they do put the Texas Health and Human Services Commission star plus handbook. And they include this section um, that they utilized and they do include other sections of that handbook that they utilize to make this determination. So that's where the actual policy or state law is coming from that has to be included with the denial notice. Um, you'll notice that they're like, directly above that we made this decision because section, um, the two sentences provided before, that's their actual rationale that they gave this client. Um, that they denied it and they approved this amount. Um, they don't provide enough within this information, information potentially, um, as you'll see a little bit underneath when we made this decision because they provide like one sentence saying you do not have a machine to help you breathe and therefore you do not meet criteria. Um, but that's the only information they provide that's supposed to be specific to this particular beneficiary, this member. Um, so if you're an individual who actually does require an individual, a machine to help them with breathing, um, it might not just be as frequent you receive this denial notice and you're not sure why exactly the service is not being taken away. Um, so again, just something to kind of consider when looking at these letters. So you might have to read and you might be disappointed because again, in this circumstance, there's literally one sentence before policy to describe why they're reducing or denying this service. Um, we wanna point out that included within the denial notice, again, that was one to two pages that they initially provide, um, you do get further information. It's not gonna be on the second or third page because I believe typically it's always, here's your two page to notice, two to three pages depending on the MCO. Um, here's the copies in Spanish and then you get the information on appeals. Um, so we want to also kind of point out that they do have um, within the red boxes, like you have the right to appeal the decision and they do provide a date, which we redacted for this particular client. Um, and then it talks more about the health plan appeals um, and continuation of services. So there's a section underneath the you must request an appeal by date um, that talks about keeping your services. And they're also supposed to provide you a date that you have to request an appeal. So this would be your initial appeal with the managed care company directly. This is not talking about a Medicaid fair hearing yet. This is your internal appeal directly with this managed care company. Um, you have 10 days from the date you receive the letter or 10 days from the date of the intended action. So that's why that effective date 
is important to look at, not only to make sure that the notice is lawful, but also to make sure that the information they're providing you within the continuation of services aspect of things so within this section is at, is actually accurate um, because that continuation of services can be vital and important to beneficiaries who you go through the process. The appeals process can take months to complete, which means if you don't ask for continued services during this appeals process, whatever the managed care company, whatever HHSC, Health and Human Services Commission, TMHP, Texas Medicaid and Healthcare Partnership, are suggesting your service has to be reduced to or what they're approving, that's what will be enforced on that 10th day or that effective date of action if you do not ask for an appeal before then with continued services. So that's an important section that you do have to pay attention to when it comes to your timeline. Um, so not only do you, they mention you can request this appeal by typically and we'll get into timelines again, but typically it might be um, 30 to 60 days that they'll give you to ask for an appeal. But that 60 days, um, you would still have to ask within 10 days to get continued services. So if you miss your window for continued services, you can still ask for an appeal. So you can still get 60 days. But because of that, that time frame. After that 10 day window when appeal isn't suggested, your services might be reduced. Um, the only time it's not affected is technically when it's a new service that you don't have or a new piece of equipment where you're not gonna get the service until the, fair, the appeal is officially decided. So the 10 days don't necessarily affect those circumstances, but as long as it's a waiver that you're on, a service that you're receiving, a piece of medical equipment that is recurring that you always receive. Um, you do have to be very cautious about your health plan 10 day window um, on when you can request continuation of services. And they do have to tell you that if you don't, don't make that request within that specific date that services might not continue. Um, there are forms, as I mentioned before, that you can physically sign that most MCOs will include within your initial denial notice packet. Um, the Health and Human Services Commission typically does this as well, where you can fill out the form and submit it formally. Now, you could request, and a lot of them will say you can call us. Um, that's a safe bet. You can always call and formally ask for an appeal. Um, so for managed care companies, you can contact your service coordinator and say, I want to ask an appeal. They should direct you to the appropriate department so you can officially request an appeal. Um, it is, we feel like it's the safest bet to send in your appeal form um, via mail and to either request um, shipping so you can actually, um, shipping information so you can actually get like when it was submitted so you yourself can monitor your 10 day window. Um, but there are forms that are supposed to make it easy. Um, I do wanna point out that um, the forms might say, do you want your services to continue? Um, and they should also include the date. So as long as you're within that range of when you date your form, you should be okay, um, especially when you mail the information. So after you have requested your initial denial notice, um, if you're dealing with just the managed care company, you will receive notification um, that they received your appeal uh, before you get your next denial notice. So oftentimes they'll say, we received your appeal of, and they'll name the service that you're appealing, or um, if it's a program, they'll just mention what exactly has been appealed, that they received it, and then their timeline to provide you with a formal decision. Um, all of this, you will receive yet another notice when they have determined the outcome of your appeal. Um, oftentimes with the acknowledgement letter that you have appealed, they might give you a timeline of when you can submit additional documentation and where you can submit that documentation to. Um, it's not as long of a letter. They don't necessarily have to give you more appeal information. 
Um, it's just a notification that, hey, we received your appeal. We have X amount of time to make a determination. When we make a determination, you will receive a formal letter. And the formal letter that you will receive, because obviously if you're receiving another letter, the service hasn't been approved. Um, so you'll receive a secondary denial notice. And this is the final determination that the managed care company will alert you to. Um, at this point, you are now ready or now able to request a Medicaid fair hearing. So if it's a service that comes from the managed care company, you do have to go through the internal appeals process first. Um, and I think we'll talk about timelines um, session two. So this is just kind of a refresher um, because we will get into more specifics as we go on um, because we wanna make sure that the information does stick and we realize that it is a lot of information to kind of take in. Um, so within the secondary notice, it's now more specific to requesting a Medicaid fair hearing. Um, and it also includes a form. So you're able to submit a form to request your fair hearing. Um, it tells you about your rights to have a representative. Um, it doesn't have to be legal counsel. It'll mention that in the letter. Um, and it'll also explain or provide um, legal aids in your area that can potentially provide assistance. So it could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be legal counsel, it could be an advocate. Um, it's someone that you can designate if you so choose um, to represent you or represent yourself with them. Um, one of the important things that I think a lot of individuals tend to not consider is even if you go through this process alone, you still have the right and the the denial notice explains that you have the right to request information from your health plan um, called your case file. Um, and you also have the right to your evidence packet or the information that's gonna be utilized to support this managed care company's decision at this Medicaid fair hearing. Now, your the evidence packet that the managed care company provides that tends to be automatically generated and sent directly to the beneficiary. Um, it should also be sent to whoever's designated the representative. The case file is a separate set of documentation and that does not have to be automatically sent. Um, although we would argue that it should be, it's something that you have to formally request. Um, it typically isn't just submitted. So your representative can ask and request for that information as soon as they're involved in your case um, and make sure that they ask for both because it is separate documentation. And your case file technically is supposed to contain you know, prior information as well. So if you, this is a service you've had for years um, or that a program that you maintain for years, if you ask for your case file, you'll see the prior assessments, prior approvals, information that was utilized previously that shows that you were eligible to kind of compare and or contrast why potentially this year or this particular authorization, the service suddenly is not approved. Um, it is important, we think it's important to kind of look at that information. You have the right to examine that information before the fair hearing. So if it's something you've formally requested and you never heard about, you have to raise that to the hearing officer and let them know that that is your due process right prior to fair hearing, that you've requested it, never received it, and the hearing officer should order that it be sent to you and your representative prior to proceeding to a fair hearing. Um, again, this notice is also going to let you know it's the same kind of situation as your initial appeal that after you receive this final denial notice, the secondary denial notice, which will be your final one before fair hearing, that you have, again, 10 days to request an, the Medicaid fair hearing with continued services. You will have a longer timeline to request a Medicaid fair hearing but the continuation of services timeline is the exact same. It's gonna be 10 days, your 10 day window. <clears throat> and we include a sample of a secondary denial notice, um, a similar individual 
so that it kind of follows from the initial denial notice we provided. It's still about um, registered nursing. Um, so we have that information. Um, and again, it'll have to have the information for requesting the denial notice, um, or excuse me, requesting why the service was requested, the rationale of why it was denied, and it'll also include, again, policy. And um, sometimes there is information about calling or asking for the guidelines as well. Um, we do talk a bit about the, and I mentioned a bit about timeframes. Um, some of the rules have changed and there's further extensions that have kind of been provided for a eternal appeal, um, which is we'll go through the managed care company or your initial appeal. Um, typically it was 30 days that had been extended to 60 days. Um, COVID extensions further allowed for additional time. Um, we're aware that those timelines may have shifted again or will shift again, but it is important to kind of note because again, it's something that should be documented or should be discussed within your internal plan. So your initial denial notice, it should be mentioned that you have 60 days um, to request an appeal and it should provide a specific date from the date of your letter. So not only should it tell you this is how long you have, but this is the specific date you have in which to request an appeal. And do not forget that that is still separate from your 10 day window to ask for the service to be um, continued. For state and Medicaid for hearing, as I mentioned, you have an even longer time frame to request an appeal than the internal appeal because it went from 90 days um, to 120 days. So that is a longer time frame to make your decision or determination. Um, however, <clears throat> excuse me, again, you saw to take into consideration continuous services. So just to be on the lookout, there will additionally be the date specific. Um, and this is more to look out for on your secondary denial notice. It still should be mentioned in your initial, but it'll be more prominent in your second denial notice because now at that point you can actually request a fair hearing um, and it'll give you the date frame and range. So it might not say you have 120 days, but it'll say you have until X date to request this appeal. Um, so if a decision is overturned, um, which means that you might get a letter, let's say after your initial appeal, that the service has then been approved. So that's what overturn means. Um, this health plan or this agency that made the decision is saying, you know, we reviewed the information. We now feel like your decision should be should have been approved. It never should have been denied. You get what was requested. Um, previously, it was that there wasn't necessarily a time frame. There was not a time limit. Just said promptly and expeditiously, um, which again is very vague language. So it's hard to determine what exactly does that mean. Um, so now it's actually a um, 72 hour rule that the service has to go ahead and be enforced and authorization issued. So that's kind of better because now it's not just what is promptly and expeditiously, you know you have 72 hours and they are aware that they have 72 hours to make sure that that service is approved. Um, so we hope this information was helpful. You can always seek further assistance from these organizations as well as Disability Rights Texas. For assistance with Medicaid appeals, call our intake line at 1-800-252-9108 or visit www.drtx.org slash Medicaid appeals to find our related self-advocacy resources.